Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. This is going to be part one of the Fisher 450T solid state stereo receiver repair. The customer authorized the repair work. And if you're curious as to what I found, uh, I urge you to go back and look at the diagnostic video uh, and assessment of this machine that occurred a couple videos back. Uh, long story short of it, the main point of failure right now is that the power amplifier is not working and we're going to see if we can get it working enough to assess what caused it to fail and what is needed to repair it. And if we come back up in here, this is the power amplifier. And there was no offset at the speakers because, well, there was no current path to the output transistors. These little fusible devices here were all open. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is we're going to put this on the dim bulb tester and jump across those and see what the amplifier then does uh, while using the bulb to limit the current so we don't smoke it and then better troubleshoot what's going on with it. Now the main problem is is that with this machine there is very limited service resources out there meaning schematic diagrams and manuals good luck. I have two manuals, both of which are missing pages, and I've kind of combined them to make one pseudo-complete manual, but I'm still missing pages for the amplifier. Now, the owner of this does have an original hard copy manual, uh, a service manual, so he's going to scan the remainder of the pages I need uh, and send them to me. So, hopefully that will cure everything, because everything I found online looks to just be a copy of somebody's incomplete service manual. There's supposed to be, I believe, 22 pages, and everybody's got 19. And I have 20, but that's two pages that are still missing. So anyways, let me get some test leads, and we'll jump her across the little blown Pico fuses and power it up and see what it does. Because this is a full DC complementary amplifier, and there's no protection at the speakers. So I think the only protection to the speakers would be to, those fuses to open up so that the current would stop flowing through the output transistors, although if it was collector emitter short, which they're not, that would definitely defeat that safety feature. So let's see what we find. All right, we've got all of our fuses bypassed. We're on a 100-watt dim bulb tester. Let's fire it up and see what happens. And... I am in fact on. Maybe we can see the little light there behind the glass. But uh, almost no current draw. So that's kind of weird. Let's take some voltage measurements here. See, we're offsetting 6 volts now at plus 40. And over here. Again, minus 6 volt offset. We got minus 40. Okay, so that's right channels. We got a 6 volt offset that's negative. Left channel, also a 6 volt offset. Minus 40. Uh, yep, yeah. all right, so let's see if that minus 6 volts, in fact, gets to the speaker terminals. And if we come back here and we go to our right speaker terminal, we have minus 6.4, left speaker terminal minus 6.4. So both channels are offsetting exactly the same. Now, when that happens... Uh, it can be assumed that there's a common point of failure since the probability of both amplifiers offsetting exactly the same are very slim. Uh, exactly the same failure. Now, if you want to convert that into watts into an 8-ohm load, you square the voltage. So make the math easy. Let's round down to 6 and we'll get 36 divided by 8 uh, would be roughly... Mm, three and a quarter, three and a half watts 
of just pure DC energy going into the speakers. Uh, so that's uh, that's not going to kill a speaker, but it's definitely going to harm its performance. Uh, now the next thing we want to find out, hooking this up to a load, is does it pass signal? Now when we had the signal tracer on it in the assessment video, uh, we got signal up to the Class A stage, and then it was distorted and weak and pretty much missing. So let's see what that looks like, assuming we run the signal through loaded and unloaded. Okay, so now that we're hooked up here, I am I have lifted the load, but we are monitoring the output. And I'm just going to switch over to auxiliary. And we're not passing any real signal here. That's what our signal looks like in the left channel at maximum volume. And we got nothing in the right. If I fade that over. And if you connect the load on either channel, It's interesting now that I connected the, the right speaker load, we have a, a hum, and we're starting to draw some current here, which is understandable because that's three and a half watts. Uh, and we can see that the positive half waveform is very crummy. Now, if we lift the right load and go to the left load, we can see now it's drawing a lot of current. It's getting pretty bright there, and now we pass no signal. And if we connect both, now we're drawing our limit at 100 watts, and it doesn't like that at all. So I'm going to go ahead and release that load. So that's where we're at. Uh, it does not. The left channel seems to not like the load a lot more. And if we come here with our scope and we take a look at the signal coming into the power amplifier, which I'll be able to do in just a moment, we can see that Coming out of the preamp right now, although we do have some DC on the right channel, probably due to aging capacitors, we do have a signal. Ooh, that's terrible. Look at that. Look at that DC offset coming out of there. Only in the right channel. Uh, very interesting. So we definitely have some bad caps there. Now, if we move up the chain a little bit, past the differential amplifier, and we come over here to the collector, come on, stay there, of the Class A device. Now we get distortion and a loss of signal. So we have no right channel, and the left channel is very much distorted. So the problem is starting somewhere between the differential amplifier and the Class A amplifier. Now typically, if we come to our Class A amplifier here, on the emitter we should have close to supply voltage and on the collector we should have drive for the output trans uh, the driver stage but we don't we have our offset pretty much everywhere uh, so there's no no drive here with the other channel again we have offset we should have close to uh, operating voltage here 
And then on the collector, we should have dry voltage. It's typically how it works, about minus 1.1 or 1.2 volts. But we've got nothing going on there. And here at this differential pair, we just have this repetitive 6 volts coming up everywhere. So I question whether the supply voltage is correct to this stage. Uh, but it's hard to say here because, oh, well, I see something there. Let's zoom in on it. Maybe you can spot it too. That resistor back there is pretty well critified. And that could be a supply resistor to that stage. In fact, yeah, there's where our minus six shows up. So that's R833. This is a 10 ohm resistor, which may not be 10 ohms anymore. It may still be. Let's check it. Looks pretty close to 10 ohms. It's 20% increase, but that ain't going to kill it. And one of the other channel is 11 ohms. Again, it's a little off, but that's not too bad. Let's go back to our visual inspection here and see if there's any more charred looking components. But that wire was nominally being obscured by this lead. So we did not see that. That looks like about a one watt device, whatever it is, or whatever it was. And measuring it, I guarantee you they wouldn't use a 3.9 meg to supply voltage to the board through that resistor. And if we follow that trace, that white trace there on the board, as you can see, that trace supplies voltage. That's the trace along the edge of the board there. That trace supplies voltage through these stand-up resistors here to the differential stage and the Class A stage. So that resistor is the reason why, so far, our Class A and our differential amplifiers are not working. But without a schematic, we don't know the value. Now, I could tell you what common values were used for a circuit like that and we can BS it and get it so that it, we can validate that it runs uh, prior to getting the schematic diagram to see what we really need. So what I am going to do is I'm going to start with a 100 ohm and we're going to work our way down until we achieve the current that we want. Um, I don't think it would have been too much higher than that but I could be wrong and if I'm wrong that's what the dim bulb tester is for. So let's clip across a 100 ohm and uh, see what we get. All right, so I've got a 100 ohm clipped in over here. It's obviously overrated. It's a 25 water. And let's see what happens when we turn on the power now. Well, the lights come on, but no excessive amounts of current draw. And let's come over here to our collectors now. We still got our minus six volts. No change there, it appears. Can I not do something right here? So we got 40 volts on one side of that. Come on. 40 volts on the other side. Maybe we're just not connected here right. There we go, we just weren't plugged in. Let's grab on here. Okay, so now we've got some current draw. That's good. And wouldn't you know it, we've lost a significant portion of our offset. Minus 25, minus 25 plus 25. Now the voltage is going to be lower because we're current limiting, but we have no offset as we can see. Oh, doesn't like that. The right channel we have 23 volts offset. No good. That's close to the rail. 
So obviously we had a problem here in our right channel. Let's see if the left channel passes a signal. That will help us rule out what we need to troubleshoot next. Let me hook up my scope here really quick. And we're going to take a look at the left channel here, which is the top one. And we can see that although it has some issues, we've got these little parasitics there. And that could be because of the reduced voltage, I'm not sure. But the right channel obviously does not work. Uh, let's see what happens when we put the left under load. We've got some crossover distortion, but the left channel is functional under load. So if we replace the little fusible devices, it can and do some work on the bias, assuming that things are still wrong when we do full voltage. Uh, and recap, of course, that the left channel is pretty much uh, functional, correctly functional. And if I adjust the bias pot here, just for grins and giggles, let's see if we can change that crossover distortion, and we can. So that circuit's working properly. Uh, so the left channel's good to go. However, the right channel ultimately has another failure since it's offsetting near the rail. Uh, and we also need to figure out uh, what that resistor value is. Although 100 ohm seems to be working fine, and uh, my resistor isn't anything more than ice cold, so it can't be moving that much current. So, uh, now we need to take a look at why our right channel is offsetting. And the first thing I'm going to do, let's compare it with the left as far as voltages. This is a slightly different design than I'm used to for sure. But yeah, we've got voltage on the Class A driver, finally. And then we've got more voltage there. But the drive coming out of it is kind of small. That explains the crossover distortion. But again, that could be because we're limited by the amount of voltage that we have. And here, if we come out, we have rail voltage essentially because if we go to one of these, We've got 24 volts there, and on the collector here, we have 23 volts here. Uh, we know that the output transistors aren't shorted. So we need to check more thoroughly in the Class AB and Class A stage. Uh, because even if the differential amplifier goes bad, this is only amplifying the difference between the two gains. So you'll usually end up with maybe 10 or 15 volts, not an entire rail. So it, we can probably rule out the little IC as being uh, the culprit here. My concern primarily is the Class A driver and the Class AB drivers. And I can definitely smell something in this area starting to get a little warm. So uh, those are the points of concern. The Class A driver is cold in comparison to the other one. AB drivers are just barely room temperature, as are the ones in the working channel. So we can't really discern from heat what's happening here. Um, but yeah, uh, left channel's fine, right channel's not. Let's see if I can come up with any more answers without having to dig into a schematic that I don't have yet. So right away, when I go between the collector and emitter of the Class A driver, we get three ohms, which is uh, not good. So that could be the reason why. Because comparing it with the other channel, uh, you can see we get a very high in the 80, 80 plus K range there. So that one's good. So this Class A driver down here is most certainly trash. And that could have been the ultimate reason why the right channel went down. Uh, and it could be that as it went down, uh, since this is supplied by the 100 ohm resistor that I'm using currently, I don't know what the value is, but since the current to that device is supplied through that resistor, that device shorted, burned up the resistor, 
And then as we saw, the offset created in the left channel as well caused uh, quite a bit of current draw and uh, burned open the little pico fuses which we bypassed. So let's see if we can figure out what you are since I don't have a viable parts list yet. I see 020053. That's like that's a Motorola part, isn't it? 02053. So is that like a 2N 2053? TR20. Could be a TR thing like the thing next to it. 2053. So let's look that guy up. Well, it for sure isn't a 2N 3053. What? How did he even come up with that? It was a 2053. Yeah, everyone just keeps wanting to refer me to the 3053, but ain't it? Yeah, the TR 2053 didn't come up. It just wants to refer you to 2SC 2053, which isn't even close. On the schematic, they're listed as Q803 and 804. And of course, one of the pages I have missing is the uh, parts list page and the schematic. And uh, this is all they give you on the giant foldout. It's referred to P2175-2. Looking at an old post from Audio Karma uh, with a little snippet of the schematic there, uh, looks like uh, TR803 and 804 or excuse me, Q803 and 804 are TR1034-3. So let's see if that comes up. Now, if you look up the device in the ECG catalog, it comes out to ECG or NTE159, which I hope that's not the right picture because that's obviously a tiny little part. And if we look up the data specs, it's an 80 volt, 800 milliamp, 625 milliwatt device doesn't show you what the bandwidth is other than it's a 30 picofarad capacitance. Come on, focus, you piece of crap. But, and then they say that that's a big old TO92, which uh, it just doesn't seem right. But they say it does what it does. Uh, I'm trying to think of what I have that could also work in its place, because 800 milliamp or 650 625 milliwatt, that's pretty stout for a little tiny thing. Well, it looks like the closest thing that I have in inventory is a 2SA1220A, uh, which is 26 picofarads on the output capacitance, whereas the original device crossed to 30 picofarads. And it's a little bit beefier at 120 volts versus 80, and 1.2 watts versus 820 milliwatts. Uh, and 1.2 amps versus 625 milliamps. So we're going to pop one of these in and we're going to see if that uh, cures the problem of our right channel offsetting. And then we'll go from there and see uh, what other scary stuff turns up. So there it is, a Fairchild device. Basing's different, but that's not a problem. So we're going to pop this sucker in. I'm going to leave you all in suspense right now because uh, i got to open the store soon and I don't have enough time to pop this in and make sure everything is happy. But we'll see that in the next video. So stay tuned for part two where we see if we can get the amplifier functional and then we'll recap it and move on to the next thing. But until then, thanks for watching and more stuff to come.